Okay, today I have the great pleasure of getting to speak to somebody who is a little bit of a legend in my mind. He came up when we had the discussion with Dr. Lippold Hocken about the Hocken Continuum. His name is Edmund Egan, and he is the person that everyone points to as the Hocken Master. And uh, he is kind of a combination of artist, composer, inventor, hacker. This is going to be a fabulous uh, interview. So uh, with that, I'm going to say hello to Edmund Egan. Hey, man, hello. how's it going? <laughs> oh, very good. Very good, Darwin. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for taking I look at the things that you do, and I just think that your schedule must be crazy with all the stuff that you have to do. Yeah, it's, um, I'm never bored. Let me put it, I don't, I don't understand that concept. Uh, I always uh, have work to do. I always have a backlog of things. I always have a dream list of things. And then when I'm relaxing, I'm, uh, I'm just daydreaming and um, mulling things over in my head. So I try to work it in. I mean, everybody, you know, time is the most valuable commodity for sure. Indeed, indeed it is. So uh, where you have been coming up a lot in both my run-ins with people as well as in my interview with Dr. Hocken was uh, you were involved in the development of the sound engine that the Continuum uses. It's the, the Egan Matrix, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So that started back when I first bought a Continuum and Unbeknownst to me, when I bought it, uh, I was actually the second person to buy one. So I, I sort of <laughs> saw it as this established, finished instrument. And, you were actually uh, the guinea pig. I was the guinea pig, yeah. And um, I saw it because uh, Lippold had a close relationship with Symbolic Sound, who developed Kima. Right. And when he developed the fingerboard, uh, there were some intimate hooks that were put in place with Kima so that the fingerboard would, continuum fingerboard would, would communicate very intimately with the uh, Kima sound engine. And at that point, the continuum did not have a dedicated DSP. It, it just had this interface card that connected with Kima. Um, and Kima's a really big and fascinating uh, DSP environment, uh, dedicated DSP environment and, and um, uh, graphical language. I was involved with Kima for quite some time, developing tools for it, and I went down to Champaign, Illinois, where coincidentally both Symbolic Sound and Hawk and Audio are in the same town where the University of Illinois is. And I went to an immersion weekend there uh, for Kima. This is prior to the continuum, and I got introduced to Lippold. And Carla from uh, Symbolic Sound, she had a... Um, continuum and I tried it and the first touch I thought oh geez this is I've never ever played anything like this you know so uh, it was just I, I thought and it was one of those things where I tried it and I said you know you, uh, this is so beautiful and interesting and and it worked really well with Kima at the time then and you know amazing amazing integration that you didn't that also astounded me like just the way that you could work with it but then I sort of put it in the back of my head, uh, mainly financially. I mean, it was, you know, an expense, relatively big expense to um, to buy a continuum. But then like six months later, I contacted Lippold and decided my cash flow was good enough. And I decided to buy one and tried it out. And, you know, it's like one of those things, uh, you've probably noticed this with new things that you get, you, you go for this initial period of um, excitement and exploration. And it's kind of like me, if I take out a gym membership, I, I'm good about three months. <laughs> <laughs> Where, you know, you just, there's so much dedication, you're doing things, and then you have improvement, and then you hit this wall. And so the wall happened with me, and I, frankly, I dropped it, you know, so that's there's it's kind of a litmus test for me with I've experimented with a lot of different instruments and I I give them a chance I see I, I'm careful before I buy so I you know I try to be an intelligent purchaser but then sometimes it just you what you thought was a conception you know you it was a misconception so I said okay well I don't know if I can work with this and I let it sit and then 
it sat for about three, four months, and I rarely played it. And then something got into me. I got back into it, and I decided, well, there's a lot of potential here, but there's a lot of things that need, I think, need to be improved because the continuum has gone through a lot of revisions. Nothing major, but just all these little things, the little things that make an average instrument and just to an exceptional instrument. And I, I caught, contacted Lippold, and uh, he's very, uh, you know, friendly and engaging. And um, I had some suggestions, and to my great surprise, he was really open to them. <laughs> I looked at it and said, wow, this is pretty cool. Like, this guy is willing to really listen to me. And what we discovered over our early relationship, and now we've, we've been friends for such a long time, but we have this real complementary uh, feature set. That we, you know, I have this ear, I can do sound design, I'm a musician, I know code in a certain way, and he's an exceptional programmer, but also he's also a, an exceptional hardware specialist, which is really, they're few and far between. So he solves problems electronically and mechanically at the same, and, they, and the continuum is very much that, it needs that synthesis of um, the mechanical part and the uh, DSP part in integration with a design that brings out the musicality within the instrument. That d relationship has been going on for, for years, ever since 2001, 2002. Um, we've gone through lots of tinkering, thinking about the instrument. There's a lot of heart and sweat and soul in this thing. And uh, and I always looked at it over the years. I mean, it's not a moneymaker. You know, this, it's a real small subset of people within the musician's world that, were, that are interested in this. But um, I've looked at it is that I've had the ability to work on something very exceptional and to have one of the top DSP programmers in the world at my fingertips listening to my idea. So I feel very blessed about that. Yeah, that's some, that's some pretty heady stuff. And you are right. Dr. Hawkins is, is amazing. Uh, when I interviewed him and he started talking about like the ways that he tried different kinds of materials to get just the right feel or different kinds of um, mechanical combinations in order to get the right responsiveness. It, I would say that not only is he a talented, not only is he a talented hardware and coder, hardware designer and coder, he's also a little bit of an obsessive compulsive, <laughs> you know? And, oh yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and you I know, wonder he... how hard it was for you to, uh, to influence him because my assumption would be that he would be very rigorous about any kind of feedback that he got. It's been over, you know, years, him trusting my um, input. So it, it's been getting, it gets easier and easier as time goes on. You know, it's like any relationship, you learn how to communicate. Right. Like he has a very particular way of um, going through a thought process. He has some interesting quirks too. He has total lack of face recognition. And it, and it makes for an interesting mind flow for him because he has to, he's got some of the most heavily do, uh, commented code you're ever going to see because he has to do it even for him to get back into it. Whenever I discuss something new, I know it's coming out of left field for him. So you, all, you almost have to wait and let him come around to your idea. So I just learned to present those things, let him figure out the flow of it, and then come back in. So it's just understanding the, you know, the, how the relationship can work. And he is very open. He, he knows that I want this thing to be the best, and he knows we have that same dedication to, that, to it. So that you know, opens the door for me. Right. Well, and also, I'm sure that your background adds to his ability to trust what you're saying. I mean, people can look at uh, 12fruit.com, which is uh, a site that's, that starts to talk a little bit about the many things you've done. You have quite a history of uh, composition and sound design work. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and how you got into it? Let's see. What... Um... I was in an exceptionally great high school. I was really fortunate. And, you know, it usually comes down to one teacher. And I can point to my the orchestral director in my high school, Steve McNeil, which um, I went to high school in Fort Collins, Colorado. And, uh, you know, this was just one of those guys that um, so positive, 
so interesting and uh, influenced my life. And and at that point, I knew I loved mathematics and I loved um, music, but I didn't know which direction I was going to go into. And having someone like Steve McNeil in my life uh, made me think, oh, this is really there's a lot of magic here and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of joy and I, I should pursue this. And so when my family moved to Canada, we're Canadian originally, but we lived around in Alaska and Colorado as my dad worked, and, and we finally settled in Ottawa. I went to university um, in, in Ottawa called Carleton, which, again, I just lucked into this. It had an intimate music department. They had invested in a um, – this would have been in the um, late 70s and then early 80s. Um, we had a Synthy 100, and I got exposed to electronic music in a – really great way and it was a very nice program i had two composition teachers there david piper and um patrick carty who uh, were really big influences in, on me and uh but what happened in school and and, and actually i'm, I'm going to be teaching at carlton again i've never taught a course before but i'm going to be in a, a winter set or a fall session with them teaching uh, film composition my idea is to teach a course that um is the kind of course that I, I desperately wanted when I was in in university, but but I couldn't get I couldn't get this practicality. I couldn't get a course that was practical in nature, and the theories um, and the structures behind all that were applied to that practicality. In the school that I, as much as I loved it, everything you were being taught by people that were teachers and never got out of the institution. So I had no idea how the heck I was going to make a living you know, doing what I wanted to do, do. I knew I wanted to do something in music. And then when I got out of school, I worked in a music store, which was, you know, I could make a living. And it was great because I was exposed to a lot of instruments there. You know, like at that point, you know, the EMU emulators were, were coming out, um, right. CSAD, all this, that sort of vintage of, of instruments. And I had, time, yeah. oh, fun. Yeah. Fun time. And, um, and so I had access to a lot. Of, so I was learning on the job. And what I did was I, I just applied myself to join a video co-op. Uh, I decided to integrate into the artistic community in town. And I met a, a video director there that, we're, that we, we've been working together since the early 80s. He developed into the video directing and cinematography world. And I developed into the uh, sound design and music for for visual world. And it just was a – so my work sort of came out from, you know, being, getting surrounded by people that were learning complementary arts. And through those complementary arts, we could help each other. And so we had collectives. And I did scores, like, for low money, for free, for a dance company. But at, at this dance company, one of the students was – another uh, radio and video producer. And so it's just a whole series of connections that came. And Ottawa is a relatively small town. So I learned to be a jack of all trades. You know, I can <laughs> do voice records. I can do edits. Um, and I, I learned about sound design. And, and man, oh, man, my uh, orchestration class and the sensitivity to picking apart a sound field, whether it's musical or sound effect or like listening to a movie and knowing what those the constructs were those are so useful and and having that ear to be able to apply and so that that musical information even though it was very theoretical and it ended up i figured out on my own how to do that practicality and interesting um, interesting yeah have you been in ottawa the whole time did you develop your whole career from out of ottawa yes how big of a city is that um, the greater Ottawa area is maybe, you know, a million, 1.6 maybe, 1.7. Okay. It's small, but it's the capital, so it's a government town. So oh, I had a lot oh, of okay, sure, government of contracts. We're not very far. We're sort of situated two hours from Montreal and four and a half hours from Toronto. Okay. So there's quite vibrant uh, production communities in both of those towns. Uh-huh. So I was able to get employed with that. And also through working through our uh, public uh, broadcasting system, CBC, I got a lot of jobs working on, on in, with them. And the nice thing about that, that's a national network. Uh, and at one point I was thinking, well, maybe I should leave Ottawa. You know, it's like I'm getting to be, you know, the pond is small here. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, you, you jump to another pond 
And then I saw I, this was would have been when I was in my late 30s. I was thinking about this, and I said, okay, well, let's. So I, I started to make this affiliation with this company in Toronto. It's it, it as we talked through things, and it was a slow kind of marriage of how we were going to get together and thinking about it. And I just realized at one point, okay, standard of living. Toronto is more expensive to live in than Ottawa. I realized how valuable it was that network that I had built up. And then I was realizing they say, okay, I can't do this move. I, what I should have done is that I should have decided early on, you know, before I got, uh, had kids and be- before I was committed to other things, financial responsibilities, I should have jumped and gone to, if I really wanted to do this, go to LA or go to New York or go, go to some large center and apply that way. Because I would jump into Toronto and I would just be, another fish in that, you know, right. slightly larger pond. So right, I, right. I, I had an established thing here. And, and then I realized, and this was actually realizing that before, that was well before we had such a amazing network of um, electrons that connect us all. So um, uh, as that has grown, it's become less and less important to, to, to be in, if physically in this sense. Physically sent- be in there, yeah, right. Yeah. I actually think that you hit on something, though, that there's a lot to be gained by being in a big city, but there's also a lot to be gained in a smaller city where there is, especially one that has some vitality to it, and especially one where everybody has to almost almost is forced to be sort of cross-disciplinary, right? I mean, some of, some of the most enjoyable things for me have been when I've been drawn into working with dance companies or working on uh, audio for video or audio for film or whatever because I was like the only guy around at the time. And you get drawn into things that you otherwise might not have an opportunity to just because you happen to be there. Yeah, you learn things. You know, even if you think that this is going to be a very mundane task, uh, you learn things. And also there's those skills, it's like I, I enjoy dialogue editing. Right. Like, you know, it's a very straightforward thing, and I love – I just love the the nature of it. And it's almost like this – it's almost like you're, you know, raking the leaves where, you know, you're doing something that's relatively simple to do. Your mind can wander as you go around those things. So I find, for me, like I'm most productive in the morning. So I tend to schedule a day around tasks – where the most intense ones are from from about 10:30 to 2:30 and then I leave the sort of administration things either bookkeeping or simpler audio tasks to for the, for the evening when I can just daydream. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually really smart. I sometimes I sometimes forget that you can get pretty drug out by the end of the day and then all of a sudden if you have to do creative sound design, you just not might not be in the right spot for that. Exactly, and your ears will be tired too. Right, indeed. Yeah, as much as I try to protect them, and I mean that's really critical. I played in a band when I was. Uh, we were kind of a progressive band, but at the time that I had joined, about a year later, it was it was going less from the Genesis uh, King Crimson loves that I had into the more uh, heavy metal end of oh, things. Okay. And uh, I sort of fell up with that, but I always wore hearing protection, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things. Even even as a young, even as a early teenager, I knew I was gonna want to be doing sound stuff. So when I'd go with my friends to ridiculous concerts, I would be the only one in the whole place with like my ears stuffed with foam. They all thought I was crazy, but I don't know. I uh, I still I maintain like pretty pretty good hearing for my age. So that that comes Excellent, through Tyler. some that comes through some effort, right? So, so the conversation goes, you're, you'll see your friends and you'll go, you'll say, Hey, uh, remember when I wore hearing protection? And they say, what? <laughs> remember when I wore hearing <laughs> Right. Indeed. <laughs> what, what is your primary instrument? Are you primarily a keyboardist? Uh, yeah. So, uh, when I was in high school, I played oboe and piano. Okay. And, uh, then through university I played oboe, but I dropped it after, as I played piano, that naturally led into because I was into electronics too, um, getting into um, synthesizers, yeah, that I sort of thing. And the oboe was an excellent instrument 
to um, be exposed to because it it brought a musicality to me that is the singing, you know, expressive monophonic oh, line. So right. I, I think it's really imperative that anyone who plays like any sort of you know, more polyphonic instrument like a guitar or a, especially a, a piano that you, you do like sing or you play in a monophonic instrument that leads you into those, the beauty of the melismas of the world rather than the harmonic structures. Right, right. Well, and it's interesting. I saw, I saw an amazing video of you performing at, uh, I think it was the the 2016 Super Booth, you did a, a demo of the Continuum and the Egan Matrix. And it was incredible to me because you had, you were using the, the Egan Matrix and it had some very, you know, what, what you would normally consider to be um, almost academic computer music sounds. You know, there was like a hard, rough edge to it. It was, it was very bright and in your face. But you really took advantage of the continuum to make it sing. And so when you say that about kind of like honoring the, the singing part of music, um, I, was imme I immediately thought of watching you play there because it was, you took what in other hands might have been kind of clangorous uh, sounds and you really extracted beauty, beauty and almost a humanity or, you know, or an organic quality out of them through the use of your playing style. And I thought that was really interesting because what it did was, first of all, it showed sort of your musicianship, but it also showed uh, what you could bring, you know, when you have that in your head, how you can transfer that into physical gestures that can make something like that uh come out of uh, an electronic music instrument it was it was fascinating oh that's very kind of you darwin to say that i have a very intimate knowledge and relationship with the instrument it's really been i've been involved so much in it and um just to go back a bit to kima when so so the interesting thing about kima is it's a very it's an immediate dedicated dsp environment and they have this structure that allows for a tremendous amount of exploration if you want. And I developed mathematical structures for control. Then I started to marry to the continuum. And, okay. and then over a few years, what we did was I had all these things that I sort of pre-built. I was always going back to these bank of things that, you know, the way that the relationship and the pressure, how, how this structure is going to go or how the, the pitch mapping goes and timbre changes. And, I developed this whole sub lexicon within um, Kima, which then we what we did decided was we we enjoyed working with Kima, but the continuum is an instrument that is um, not easy in the sense that you have to practice. I would say it's easier than a violin or easier than a French horn, but it's still when you go into the electronic world, they have this really weird setup where you don't think you know things are supposed to be easier for you but and if they're supposed to be expressive well if you're expressing <laughs> easiness that just shows surface thought what you right. actually have to do is get really really deep into and dedicate to it you know yeah, it's like yeah. I've, I've been able to dedicate to it so when we developed the engine i had all of this math that we could apply to the shark within that we decided to build into the continuum and it's a structure that has been set up to take full advantage of an integration between this playing surface and the sound engine that is behind it. And, and we, we did that because people were getting frustrated by trying to integrate the continuum, like, which is hard enough to worry about and to play, right. and to work with something like Kima, which is also hard to get into deeply, or even the plethora of, um, of uh, MIDI synthesizers out there, which were not designed they were designed to work with switches, not with continuous control. Right. Uh, that's where the, the DSP engine came. And because of all that real deep integration, you can get your fingers to sing into the electrons. That's what I find, you know. I've heard that with other people. I can't remember there was one. There's a guy named Moldover who does some yes. beautiful things on guitar. Right. And there's a fellow that does Korg demos 
Um, he does. He plays the pads. He's very exp- amazingly. I forget his name. Anyway, it, like it is possible with these instruments, we can be more than just a, an overseeing overseer of the automata within a system. <laughs> right, you know, right. We can actually get in and start start to shape that. I think a lot of people want to do that, and I think there's a lot of musicianship that can be exposed. But it's easy also to be beguiled by that automata and say, you know, to fall in love with. Uh, especially working with modular synthesizer, falling in love with the sequencers and, and listening and that sort of thing. Right. Whenever right. I program a, a modular synthesizer, the first thing I do is I have a gate on it so that I purposely don't listen to the sequencer going all the time or, the, you know, at, at building my structure. Because what happens is, is that I just, I don't construct a patch that is going to, um, allow me to play something, what I do is entertain myself as I explore this patch searching routine. And at the end of it, I've exhausted that entertainment. Right. And the continuum, it allows you to program that way too, where you're designing a sound to be performed because it's always under your fingers. That's one reason why we don't have very much sequencer control within the ego matrix structure. Yeah. So you, you do that on purpose to make it, I, (laughs) It's really interesting perspective, and it's an interesting sort of constraint to put on the system to force playing. I, I think that's that's an amazing insight. Well, both Lippold and I have the same uh, belief system that way. You know, it's like he does, like he, uh, I, I got to say, that guy with that shark in there, he's the world expert in that shark uh, family. He does things, he's been into that code, he's found, I mean, just gone deep deep into the into the architecture of it and so there's a lot of wonderful things that can happen when you dive deep into something that's never really been fully explored right. you know like there's all these things going on and there's there's design constraints where you say okay well we're not going to have any io for external ram so people who want to do a sampler well that's not going to happen because there's only so much uh, RAM in there, and the RAM that is in there is is limited in in size, but it's extremely quickly addressable, which allows you to do all sorts of interesting things. You know, it's like people listen to this this violin viola cello bass sound that I ended up doing, and um, it's a full range instrument. It goes all the way to below the contrabass to as high as a violin can go over the full range of the continuum, which is larger than a grand piano. And that's all based on one 150 millisecond anal- analysis of a viola D sharp. <laughs> and it's all because because of that ra- rapid access and the way that we can do granular and break up that system, you can, you can change it and make it completely sure. work within all these different ranges. So that's one of the examples of when you, when you do a limited you know, feature set, great things can come out of it. You know, Brian Eno said, you know, don't give me more than three things or I'm paraphrasing, but that's it. Because once you go past three, you know, you, you just start to get lost. You need, you need to focus. Well, it's also interesting that, that this kind of the concept of the Egan matrix really started off inside the chemo world, but you ended up really focusing on these kind of affordances between playing and access to the sound engine. It's interesting because, you know, whether you're talking about a chemo system or like in my case, Max or whatever, so often you get into these like programming systems and you either take a deep dive into the sound design or you take a deep dive into sequencing or generative work. But so often the attachment to controls and the attachment to the real world, you sort of like dash that off at the at the end as if it was like, you know, it was like sort of a, a compulsory part of the exercises, but not something that's that could be inspiring. And it sounds to me like you actually found that to be sort of the center of a different kind of exploration that you really maximized. Yeah, so to do the GUI and the, the, that, that interface, we use Max for the Egan Matrix. And it's completely, and the, the, Max is just an absolutely amazing environment to work in. I just love it. It, it solves issues for us 
that we don't have to worry about Windows and Mac support because it's built in. So when we build the app, it's it, you know another Cycling seventy four is is worrying about that that integration for us. So it it really frees us up. We didn't want to do uh, we didn't want to do anything really fancier than that. So within that constraint, knowing that we wanted to work with MIDI, we designed a system. And this comes back to my university days and being exposed to the EMS instruments. We had that beautiful Synthi 100 right. at a Putney that was like compared to the Synthi. When I think <laughs> about it now, the Putney had a dust cover on it and I use it as a music stand, <laughs> a VCS3. So, um, but what I loved about that was that instrument was this beautiful uh, patching matrix, right? And in, in not buffered either. So I mean, the, you, this thing would live as you patched it. The other parts of it, you know, it's like you're you're loading things into this tippy boat. So as soon as you yeah, patch over here, you've loaded this yeah. side. Now you got to go over and adjust what the other <laughs> side did. You get all this crosstalk sure. and great stuff. But that that simple idea just that patch matrix and deciding to i mean the ego matrix it's simple but it's complex because the simplicity of it is that we built these uh, modules based on our uh, lippold and my experience of um, particular types of dsp design what kind of things would be interesting to explore uh, what things can we breadboard in here and try them out there's a bunch of that in there too some things are more successful than others Mm -hmm. But we decided to make every single pin that you, when you patch, every single pin is a formula that is a relationship of where your finger is in the three-dimensional area, as well as some select automata, like we have these phase generators, which are essentially, you could think of them as LFOs, mm -hmm. but they're also under finger control, and they appear within a formula, so your pin is this particular formula which can be a relationship of a very simple formula. Let's just say you put your finger down, it puts out a constant, or it can be this really complicated, intimate relationship. And so that that pinpoint, that can be, once you plug it into the matrix, your finger is controlling the pin. So there are no VCAs within the design because your finger automatically does the multiplying to in that column to get things out. And so... It just means that within a patch, you can have dozens, just dozens of, of very particular points that integrate within that sound design. So when you play it, it doesn't even matter if it's, like you said, like play these kind of harsh electronic things, the musicality can come across. Right. right. Yeah, which is a real fantastic thing. I, I really enjoy, I, I'm still learning things about it. It's It's great. Working with these highly expressive controllers. Now, I, I don't own a continuum. I wish I did. I remember the first time that I ever touched one, I almost like jumped back because it felt it, it felt so alive, right? Um, but, you know, I've, I've worked with some other sort of expressive controllers. And one of the things that's interesting is the, the extent to which it sort of draws you or it, it sort of almost requires you to re-engage with the concept of virtuosity. I mean, you talked a little bit about how modern electronic music is sort of set up to make it feel like you're an overlord of a system as opposed to an instrument player, right? But um, the the continuum, and, and especially the people who are designing for it, it are... And, and working with it on making patches and chemo or in Max or whatever, um, are more and more becoming really focused on things that require virtuosity on the thing. So this idea of like, we don't have any VCAs because now your touch is uh, provides that functionality, right? How do you allow people to get an introduction to an instrument like that. I mean, one of the things that we look at is the the re, the only reason it seems that people take up violin anymore is because a previous generation had done violin, <laughs> you know. So they're sort of like compelled to say, "Well, if I want to sound like Itzhak Perlman, I have to take the violin." Um, how do you, with a new instrument that requires some virtuosity, draw people into playing it? Yeah, that's a good question, Darwin. 
you know, if someone plays a violin, what they're picking up on, or a piano, or a viola, or a flute, centuries of fine tuning, of humanity putting their fingers on this thing and refining and refining and refining. And also at the same time, you're inheriting the dedication of composers that wrote for it. So they brought out the musicality within the instruments and the instruments kind of go hand in hand with what kind of compositions, the compositions inspired instruments and vice versa. So if you get into that world, there's this whole historical content context that um, you can exploit uh, and take advantage of and uh, revel in that is um, a real good lifelong goal. You know, I, I, I think those are great things to do with something new like the continuum. We don't have much of a history like we play. We 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 played a little bit of the last um, con continue continue con concert. We did some messian uh, things that were written for Martineau or um, in the next um, continue con that was coming up at Urkham in, in late April. We're going to be playing a um, six a piece for six or uh, three Troutoniums that um, oh, Paul Hindemith right. wrote right. when Oscar Sala was was working with him. So we can go into that that kind of repertoire, which is relatively new repertoire when you compare the repertoire that you get within the you know piano literature or, or a violin literature. Right. So um, yeah, in terms of having people get interested in it. I mean, it's something that's new. Uh, all I can tell when people ask me about it is that it is worth dedicating your life to. I mean, I've, I've found so much great musical enjoyment, I, it, and it gets better and better every day. You know, it's like it's – and I, I have absolutely – this is nothing to say against anyone who is also a um, – you know, loves to let the automata – go under control and, and have some other sort of meta role within the musical structure. I think that's an equally valid thing. And I've just heard amazingly beautiful things come out of that quite complex, seemingly chaotic, but within this grander scheme of, um, of uh, design that, that can go on. You know, someone like Richard Devine comes to mind. In that right, sort of sure. uh, one of the things that you mentioned that I hadn't even thought about was taking advantage of some of the kind of modern-ish instruments for which a certain amount of, of composition had been done, like the, the Martineau, for example. Uh, and I, at first, it's, it's sort of like, well, you know, why, why would you, you know, why would you need to do that? But then if I think about it, or why would you want to do that? But if I think about it, there was an awful lot of music that was composed for lutes that nobody's playing with lutes. They're using, they're using classical guitars for, right? Or things that were originally written for harpsichord that people regularly play on piano. I think it's actually kind of interesting to consider that some of these things like, a, like music written for a tritonium or for a martineau might, might well be a great case of compositions that are viable for a, a continuum player. That's really fascinating. Yes, and, and, you know, you can sort of extend that out to think about, you know, when we listen to a, a, a Mozart sonata, um, it doesn't sound like the way it was written. It wasn't, that's not the instrument it was written for. Right. You know, the piano's gone through a tremendous revolution, evolution, too. So, you know, the, the, all these instruments, they're dynamic, they're of the day. And we're, we're in a time now where, um, this digital electronic re re revolution we're in. I mean, this is this acceleration curve that we're going through in terms of things changing. I mean, it's just I I, I can only see it becoming just more and more mind blowing. Right. Um, we're we're at really at the cusp of the quantum computer too, which is going to you know dramatically change our world and change the ideas that we have. But but within all that, we still have. You know, this musicianship, this primal thing that the human part that comes about, um, the most beautiful thing when when I'm asked, we say, well, what's the most beautiful thing the continuum does for you? And what the continuum has done is it's improved my ear to listen to harmonics and temperament. And I've re rediscovered just the beauty of just intervals. 
you know, and I've always wondered why, why am I so beguiled by Cronus Quartet? You know, when I listen mm-hmm. to the Terry Riley, uh, Salome Dances for Peace, right. and I listen to this thing, I go, you know, there's just something about this musicianship and these people are playing all these adjusted intervals and the continuum get, can give you that ability. I mean, it's, it's, it can micro like it's, Lippo was telling me, you know, there's some numbers. When you ever ask him numbers, he's always a little evasive because there's, he, he knows what the, what the things are. But it's like microns you're dealing with right. in terms of how your fingers move. It's just an amazing system and it allows you to do this fine tuning that you don't even realize you're doing until you, you listen back and you, you go, wow, every single third, major third, I'm playing that third flat because it just sounds right. right. And it also depends on the... Um, uh, the patch that you're doing. So you tend to play simpler sounds on the continuum and they just have, seem to have more life. Like I, I can play a sine wave on that thing forever. Yeah, well, and again, it, it ends up, you know, uh, inspired watching you, but, you know, another person who was a continuum user whose, whose work I loved was was Richard Linhart. He uh, evoked such beauty with his playing. And, you know, yeah, it was... Some of it was the fact that it was hooked up to Buku and doing that thing, but a lot of it was he was very mindful about his playing technique on that instrument surface, and it it ended up having his voice, which was which is I think one of the things that expressive controllers allow you to do. It really allows you to have a voice come through these electronic instruments like you said you're reaching in and you're like making the electrons sing right yeah and and richard he's he was amazing and the thing that he did with that bukla he developed a patch that he didn't change yeah because he had a world that he could explore in there and he realized man i've i've dived dived into this very particular part of this musical universe that I exist in, and I'm finding great inspiration and joy in it. I, I, it's just amazing when I saw, see videos of when he was playing, and um, yeah, he had a, a, a really nice approach to the music that he brought in the, his continuum playing, and that bookla patch with just the a sea of of of, of <laughs> cable seaweed in front of it. I, know. I don't know how he, you know, that's the one thing about, you know, the Euro rack and, and that kind of size of things. You just end up with this cable mass in front of you. That's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, very nice thing. Well, unfortunately, our time is already up and I feel like I'm just getting started. But so that means that we're going to have to talk again uh, soon. But before I let you go, I am a little curious about ContinueCon. It's something that came up. It comes up when I talk to our friend uh, Clifton Cameron. He's a friend of both yours and mine. But it com- it came up when I talked to uh, Dr. Hacken as well. Can you describe a little bit what those are? I think the first wasn't the first one last year. Uh, we've had two so far. Oh, you've had two so far. Yeah. Okay. So the the way the well, ContinueCon is like this, it is like a family reunion of a family that's completely functional. So it's not like a Thanksgiving dinner where you're going to meet that uncle that just creeps you out. Or, <laughs> you know, everybody, it's, people go, go there because they want to and, and they enjoy it. The first two were in Asheville, North Carolina, because Asheville strangely, or not strangely, beautifully enough, has the largest con- uh, collection of continuums, which is not that large. I mean, we're talking about instruments that, you know, the, I don't know how many are extant, 600 maybe, 700. So, and, and, and it's a gathering of, um, uh, the first two were there, and it's a, it was, it's a gathering of roughly 25 to 35, 40 people. Every, everything's about the continuum. We talk about, I do talks about the Ego Matrix, and the next one that's going to be at Urkham in Paris, I'm going to talk. I'm going to t- one talk is just just deconstructing one preset and going through every formula and talking about why I did what I did, you know, and what the influence of. of. And then we have concerts where people perform in the evening, and the concerts are quite amazing because it's the equivalent of if you if you said if you invited all these guitarists, you know. You would have everything from classical to Segovia to Steve oh, Vai to, sure. you know, right. it, it, there's just such a wide range. And the continuum really brings in all that 
that wide range of uh, musicianship and musical styles as well. So it's 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 a real great thing. And we've had some people come to the conference who don't have continuums. So, um, but Clifton has come, and it's uh, it's always great to see him. I really enjoy his presence. I don't see him very often. He's been uh, doing being our um, continuum rep at the NAMM show because he's right in LA there. It's right. very handy for us, but we, we, we tend to um, now just go to the super booth in uh, Berlin. That's becoming a popular place for, uh, for this kind of stuff because uh, it draws a real focused community together. Oh, it's fantastic. If you if you I mean, I can't, I can't say enough about super booth. If you're in, if you're into this, well, first of all, you're going to Berlin Right, which is cool. way better than going right. to Frankfurt. Yeah. yeah. Berlin is such a fascinating, wonderful city. And um, Schneider's Bureau and Schneider's Law and um, Andreas Schneider, he he runs a great show. And it's all in this huge children's museum. It's a reappropriated building in next to a park. It's wonderful. And there's just all sorts. I mean, if you're into Eurorack, it's Eurorack heaven. Um, but there's all sorts of other things. There's all sorts of uh, wonderful, you know, people in that community that I get to uh, touch base with again and just see all these different ideas going. And um, there's a lot of amazing passion for the, you know, for that instrument building. That that end of it is very cool for me. And we just, it's a nice way for us to, I mean, we try to advertise the continuum, but it, but it's, you know, there are not many around. So the thing is, we, it's nice when you can get it into a place where people can try it. And, right. and, you know, because like you, you know, when you played it, it's like all of a sudden you're you're, you're realizing, oh, geez, there's there's there is something here that uh, it, it, the one fault of the continue, I would say, is that when I play, you know, you might as well watch paint drawing <laughs> because <laughs> it's that's the, the movements are so our fingers are so t- t- actually sensitive right. that you don't have to move very far to do that. You know, so there's a lot that happens in the continuum that it's just micro movements that you, you, you just, you, you need a, basically a, a, a jeweler's loop in front of the, <laughs> to, to, to catch it. So that visual aspect is really lacking within it, but uh, it's more tied to the way that the, I think the human body reacts and we've been able to take advantage of in the electronic world, not having acoustic constraints you know that the body has to be this size and the string needs to be this long and right. this hard to play because that's the kind of sound that you want to get you you do have that freedom but within that freedom you have to design a haptic system that has the appropriate amount of, of feedback and what what we've learned is that and much like you see the way pianos and synthesizers develops where the touch on a synthesizer is much lighter because it can be you mm-hmm. know right and and the and the continuum is lighter because it can be so you, you learn to adjust to that and you end up having – it's within the right muscular range of, of finger movement that uh, we found has is, is created the maximum expressiveness. Indeed. Well, Emin, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule. This has been a fascinating chat. Uh, I can't wait for the next time we get to talk um, or maybe the next time that we get a chance to run into each other. I. Uh, if nothing else, I every year I try and find a way to make it to the super booth, or uh, maybe I can get you to come to a Knobcon or something like that. We can find some way to. Oh, you go to the to place. Knobcon in Chicago with Suit well, and Tiger. I'm I, I hoping to. One of the uh. problems for me with that is that it's it's always the same weekend as my anniversary, but I think I can trick my wife into going to the lovely city of Chicago and just slip away, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I want, I'm sure that'll go that over well. Yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's supposed yeah. to be a, a pretty neat thing as well. But anyway, we'll find a way to get together at some point. But in the meantime, I want to thank you for your time. And um, I'll let you have the rest of your day. Well, it's been a pleasure, Darwin. It's very nice to uh, chat with you. And yes, I do hope we do it again soon. All right. Sounds great. Talk to you soon. Okay, take care. Okay, I want to thank Edmund a lot for having a chat today. Uh, It was uh, really great to get caught up with him. We've heard so much about him over the years, and so it was really fantastic. So thanks to him for that. Thanks for Clifton Cameron for helping out uh, with getting him in play as well. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you, the listeners, for showing up again this week. 
Uh, it was great, as always, to hear from those that have written me. And very encouraging to see the number of additions we had to the YouTube page. Again, I'll remind you, one of the things we're trying to do for the podcast here is bump up our YouTube subscriptions. Uh, so if you can just sort of like track this podcast down in YouTube, use that as a way to sign up for a subscription. That'll help us out a lot. In the meantime, uh, just keep on keeping on. Check us out next week when we'll have yet another fascinating interview. And as always, if you want to drop me a line, ddg at cycling74, I'll do it. Thanks a lot, and we'll catch you next week. Bye.